Okay, then let's turn to the third part of the Miller Report um, to Dr. Francis Markham, a research fellow at the Centre for Aboriginal Economic Research Policy at ANU, who will discuss research findings about Indigenous languages and wellbeing. Over to you, Francis. Thanks very much for the introduction, um, Campbell and uh, Casey. I'll also share my screen, hope it, this uh, works and can be seen. And I'm presenting work on behalf of a big team of collaborators of which um, Campbell was one. Um, so as, as a little bit of background, um, Yonatan Dinku, myself and Danielle Venn led a piece of work um, as, for the second pillar of the NILA, uh, which was looking at the quantitative connections in um, uh, statistical data collections about connections between Indigenous language use and indicators of well-being. Um, the findings of this are available in our CAPER working paper as well as in the NILA report. So there's more detail in the separate working paper and the key findings are really summarised in the NILA itself. So we were asked to examine the linkages between Indigenous language use and indicators of well-being in quantitative data holdings. And we reviewed as part of this process several um, potential data sources, um, the ABS census, the longitudes, Longitudinal Study of Indigenous Children, uh, and then the two key ABS Indigenous surveys, the, the Social Survey or NATSIS, and the Health Survey uh, or NATSIS. And we ultimately ended up settling on the NATSIS for a var variety of reasons. And perhaps we can talk about some of them in the breakout groups later if you're in that um, section of this um, seminar today. So in terms of how the NATSIS measures Indigenous language use, we were able to compile um, two variables from various questions in the NATSIS about Indigenous language uh, repertoires, as we put, called them, at the individual level. Um, and so we, on the basis of several questions, we categorised each person in the survey, or each adult in the survey, I should say, into four categories based on the languages that they speak, understand, or are learning um, into people who speak English only, people who speak English as a first or main language, but also um, speaks or understands an Indigenous language um, well, also people who um, uh, speak English as a first language and speak or understand an Indigenous language in a, a few words um, rather than speaking the language well. And people who speak an Indigenous language as a first um, or main language. We also had a variable um, re relating to English proficiency. Um, so these kind of two variables mirrored each other to some degree. We were trying to integrate the language ecologies concept that um, Denise has outlined as well into this report. And we were somewhat hampered by the geographical data available in the NATSIS survey. And so we really ended up with a much cruder sort of map than the one that uh, you saw on the screen before. It just classified Australia into two or in some ways three areas. Um, in remote and very remote um, parts of Queensland, WA and the NT. Um, we called those areas um, Indigenous L1 or Indigenous L1 frequent areas. Um, in much of the uh, more urban areas of Australia, um, we, and you can sort of see a list here of these regions, we uh, classify those areas as areas where traditional languages are a second or subsequent language and English is predominantly a first language. Um, and there's a few areas that we left out of that classification as well because uh, it, they can, were really too uh, internally diverse. So they're the kind of measures of Indigenous language use that we included in this study. Um, there are a wide range of indicators that were related to well-being that we looked at um, as well. I won't go into all of them in detail today, um, but if you're interested, you can read the report. 
Um, and we examined the connections between Indigenous language use and each of these 35 um, indicators using a multiple regression um, approach. Um, and again, I won't go into that, but it's suffice to say it's the kind of um, modelling approach which looks cross-sectionally at correlations between two between these variables after adjusting for a whole range of other related variables. So we're trying to take account for things like, you know, age, employment, and a whole range of other variables. These are the kind of results that we um, published in our working paper. And they show, so this, for example, shows the um, predicted probability of somebody reporting that they regularly visit their homelands or country. Um, for those people who don't live on their homeland or country. And these predicted probabilities are um, shown depending on the uh, language use of the individual. And these stars mean that the relationship between language use and um, the outcome variable, in this case, visiting country, um, is statistically significant. And what you can see here is that compared to people who speak English only, as the um, proficiency in Indigenous languages increases, um, the probability of somebody regularly visiting their homelands also increases. And this, we've broken this kind of um, approach. We've got a bar chart here. We've broken this down by language ecology. So in areas where Indigenous languages are frequently spoken as a first or main language, that relationship holds, and it also holds in areas where um, our traditional languages are spoken as a second or subsequent language. Um, so they're the kinds of results that are in um, our report. And so to summarize the overall findings in the interests of brevity, there were really very strong relationships in the survey data between uh, Indigenous language use and variables related to cultural identity and participation and variables related to connection to country. This um, may not be a surprise, but it really is confirmation of what um, everyone who's probably attending this forum would expect. Uh, variables related to social connectedness and emotional well-being also showed very strong correlations with uh, Indigenous language use. And once again, this really confirms what um, many people here have probably been saying and hearing for a very long time and were probably encapsulated in those quotations that Denise presented at the start of her presentation. Um, there were also strong correlations between Indigenous language use and work in and employment from, sorry, work in an income from cultural industries such as arts and crafts production and um, paid employment in various cultural activities. We didn't, there were other areas where we found um, weak or non-existent relationships between Indigenous language use and the um, wellbeing indicators. These related to things like physical health, um, uh, various education um, measures, although some of those education measures are um, require a bit of unpacking, as well as income and employment measures overall. So not just focusing in on um, culture related industries, but overall income and employment. And there are also some notable kind of bad results. And I think these are also important to bear in mind. And these were that there were strong relationships between Indigenous language use and people reporting experiences of racial discrimination, people reporting experiences of having been arrested by police, and people reporting difficulties accessing services, um, both overall accessing services and specific services such as health, housing and violence support. And so I think it's really important to um, remember that there's uh, in Australia, um, the way that the country, country is currently configured, um, Indigenous language users also face real barriers um, uh, in their dealings with the rest of the settler state. In terms of policy implications, 
Um, there's some very clear ones, which are that language learning, strengthening and reawakening are likely to have flow-ons to certain non-language policy objectives. But it's also not a silver bullet in all policy areas. And that at least in our study, we couldn't um, detect big income, uh, employment or health, uh, physical health effects. And this is only a first study, and it's not to say that these effects don't exist, um, but they're probably not, uh, if they do exist, they're probably not huge in magnitude, but there'll be more, more detailed work um, coming out in future from other research groups that will go to those questions. And there's also the issue that language speakers may require support to deal with increased discrimination and policing, um, and that interpreting services and the like are really important for people to be able to access services where currently language is a barrier. It's also a further implication that um, we um, uh, found that the quantitative language data on Indigenous language use is relatively poor and that there needs to be quite a bit of work done um, I think on the official statistical collections to really improve the quality of the data that's collected. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francis.